DiscerningHearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined once again by Father Robert Spitzer, who is the president of the Magis Center of Reason and Faith and the Spitzer Center. He was the president of Gonzaga University from 1998 to 2009. He's the author of many books, including Healing the Culture, Finding True Happiness, Five Pillars of the Spiritual Life, The Light Shines On in the Darkness, The Soul's Upward Yearning, and God So Loved the World. With Father Robert Spitzer, we go inside the pages of Christ vs. Satan in Our Daily Lives, The Cosmic Struggle Between Good and Evil, published by Ignatius Press. We now continue with part two of our conversation with Father Robert Spitzer. This is the book I'm hoping, I'm hoping will now be used as a standard text in the seminaries and in spiritual direction schools. I hope that parishes have this because this is, I I think, one of the best that I've ever read that in that understanding of what we have termed spiritual warfare and the discernment of spirits. Oh, absolutely. And and how you, in that uh, the great wisdom of dividing up the deadly sins into that, you know, part one where it's the five, those are the ones that hook us. But when yeah. you uh, broke out part two, the big three, and the wisdom yeah. you had in splitting pride and vanity, because pride would love to be hidden in our understanding oh, yeah. of vanity, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. I mean... The desire for power and control, you know, it's it's in us all, you know, that we, we do want to have control over other people. And, and, you know, if you get Hitler-esque, of course, you want to have control over lots of people and power and even the power over life and death, the power to manipulate, the power to, you know, to, to, to really control people's lives and things of that nature and which we can see you know on a on a gross scale uh, even in our culture today but that sin of pride it, it, it's uh, it's really very insidious and uh, there's of course good biblical accounts but you know i i think macbeth is always a a good mm-hmm. i i just use literature to to illustrate this in in the deadly sins areas because uh, a lot of people think well you know uh of course the Bible is going to talk about these deadly sins. Of course the Bible does talk about the deadly sins, because the Bible is holy and the deadly sins are not. So, I mean, mm-hmm. they're going to have to point it out. But the the, the other point is, I, I just use literature, so I just say, well, you know, Shakespeare talks about the deadly sins. I mean, Macbeth is pride par excellence, you know, and uh, Othello's Iago. I mean, you know, and, and, and uh, I mean, Shakespeare's uh, Iago in, in the, in the uh, tragedy uh, Othello is unbelievable believably envious. I mean, this guy is, as he says, all my schemes are hatched in hell. You know, he, he proclaims mm-hmm. it from the yard arms. And, and then, of course, Hamlet is the poor, uh, you know, guy who unwittingly moves into anger. Right. And But I, I, I use it because I think Shakespeare's genius here is that who has a right to be angry more than Hamlet? I mean, Hamlet got dealt a raw deal by his uncle Claudius. Mm -hmm. His uncle Claudius pours poison into his father's ear, marries his mother, takes over the the kingdom, and, you know, the ghost tells Hamlet, hey, you know, your uncle Claudius did this, and uh, we need a little revenge here. And, of course, Hamlet's angry. And as all my students would say, well, he's got every right to be angry. Yes, he does have a right to be angry, but listen to the Lord, what the Lord is saying. You may have a right to be angry, but, you know, when you let it get to you, when it becomes your primary motive, if instead of defending yourself against anger, anger all you want is vengeance, right? Because anger produces that, that uh, definite desire for vengeance, for retribution, etc. You know, once that 
you cross the line, and anger does so easily lead uh, to vengeance, which is why the Lord speaks against it and says you have to be so cautious. One thing to be righteously uh, indignant, it's another thing to be so angry that you want retribution, right? It, it, mm-hmm. Once you cross the line, look at what he does. He kills, of course, Polonius, you know, who's hiding behind the curtain because he mistakes him uh, for his uncle Claudius. Then, uh, you know, his, his fiance, you know, Ophelia is, uh, you know, uh, uh, commits suicide because of her dad's death. And then, of course, uh, his, his best friend Laertes, is Polonius' son, who now despises Hamlet, challenges him to the duel. And, and at the end of the duel, what has happened? Hamlet is dead. Laertes is dead. His mother is dead. Uncle Claudius is dead. And, and of course, the whole thing is like this bizarre thing. And the, the only one who deserved to die is Uncle Claudius. But anger. Look mm-hmm. at this effect. And, and so it just basically trying to say, well, here's Shakespeare. And I do believe that Shakespeare was a religious person. I I do think he had a terrifically acute spiritual sense, which is why he was uh, very good in, uh, with the virtues and vices in his tragedies. But, it, you know, I think, why not use these literary examples? I mean, I think Scrooge is mm-hmm. so greed par excellence. I mean, you know, Dickens was marvelously ingenious at portraying it. And that one scene, um, you know, that uh, I, I kind of quote, you know, we're, um, and here it is, we're coming on the Christmas season. But take a look at the George C. Scott scene. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, this is right in the book, of course, but but uh, Scott does it so well. When the, uh, the people who are ringing the bell, they're trying to, you know, get some uh, funds, you know, Christmas funds for the poor, the, the houses for the poor. And uh, and Scrooge looks at it and goes, no, no, I don't think I'll be contributing to that. And mm-hmm. of course, the person says, well, why not? You know, you know, this is the Christmas season. You know, Christ. You know, asks us. You know, and he goes, do you think I will contribute to the continued propagation of that breed that are in poverty, sucking our economy dry? Indeed, Christmas would be better if we had a few less of those people. Now, of course, we hear this all the time on the lips uh, of the elite in this culture. Uh, And by the way, uh, they are exonerated. But Dickens has removed them from you know, the domain of people who are in the media or in the uh, educational establishment. And what does he do? He, he puts uh, Scrooge into, you know, this uh, mean, greedy capitalist. Well, I think it's just a perfect position where people can say, wow, you know, I can't believe that he would make that statement. Mm-hmm. He's heartless. He's actually advocating that these people die and die in grotesque numbers so that he can have a little better world for his, you know, sort of greedy adornments. Are you kidding me? And of course it's shocking. And Scott, so uh, George C. Scott was so good. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was the best Scrooge ever. And, and, and you look at that and, and all of a sudden that's when the dream sequence, almost as if God you know, wants to rescue Scrooge. And and the reason he does is because this all starts in his childhood. Mm -hmm. This all, you know, he sees the development, but he's trying to tell Scrooge in Christmas past, well, this is why you are the way you are, you know, but you don't have to be that way. You, you, you've succumbed to something. You've succumbed at once to despair. And you, you know, and in this despair, this despair of love, this despair of God, why you have given yourself over to mere material wealth and you have a you have no heart and so you know as this kind of progresses and he sees himself right in Christmas future, right the grave scene mm-hmm. so forth you know that but the main thing is it's beautifully portrayed because in 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 that book, you not only have where does this sin of greed lead, but you also have God cares enough even about a fellow who makes these horrible remarks about, you know, just, you know, almost, you know, <laughs> euthanizing almost, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a categorical, uh, you know, Hitler-esque sort of scheme of getting rid of people. God cares enough to try and rescue him and does 
turns him around and makes him a force for the good. So all these things, you, you say, well, okay, yes, the, all these things are in the Bible, and I do point out some of those good stories. Oh, David provides many good stories, mm-hmm. and Saul, for, for uh, good deadly sins, uh, uh, writ large. But also, you get um, you know, so many other ones uh, portrayed in, in literature as, as well. And so I try to, you know, uh, to point out you know, the, the, uh, the deadly sins of <laughs> that you know, room with a view, um, you know, is uh, such a, a mm-hmm. great piece of literature, and they made a movie, a contemporary movie out of it uh, that was great. But you know, um, uh, Claude Vicey, uh, you know, uh, so uh, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> such a, a, a horrible little character. You know, he's he's just sloth and incarnate, and um, you know that one scene where. Um, you know, he's in the restaurant, you know, of the of the, mm-hmm. the home, the almost the pension there. And uh, these English ladies come up and go, oh, Mr. Vicey, what, what is your profession? <laughs> and he mm-hmm. says, my profession? Oh, well, if I, if I had to declare one, I, I suppose it would be leisure. Mm-hmm. My philosophy, an altogether unjustified one, is that I might do whatever I please so long as I don't hurt anyone. It is, after all, a sign of my decadence. He's mm-hmm. proud of himself. Mm-hmm. You know, he's, let, he's justified the sloth to the point where he's just he's bragging about it. And, of course, these ladies, are the jaws are on the ground. But it, it, the scene is so beautifully portrayed. But you look at that and you go, how could this person throw away his life with such reckless abandon? You know, that the talent that gets buried a thousand, is, you know, is miles deep, you know, he, mm-hmm. he's buried it so deeply with that, that bragging sort of attitude. How did that happen? Well, because Satan has a very, very solid program that he has devised to take people with that proclivity and just drive it right into the ground so that they not only waste their lives, but bring a phenomenal amount of despair into the lives of the people around them. Mm-hmm. So I just thought, well, you know, I'm going to use these good, these piece of great literature, some movies to, you know, uh, to, to sort of, you know, point out that these, these are things to be, you know, reckoned with in Anna Karenina. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, oh man! I mean, she. There, there's some really good movies of Anna Karenina too that that I think are, are kind of recent productions that are actually very very good. But the book is is very very good as well. But it's all about you know how does the devil work to uh, to get to seduce us you know into the rationalizations that justify lust and infidelity and betrayal and she's got all the rationalizations down i mean mm-hmm. she's really good at it but at the end of the day you know when count vronsky just says well i know you left your child and you left your husband and you, you just plummeted your husband into despair came begging to you back begging for for you know and said he would forgive you and everything else you just sent the whole family into despair you you sent, you told all your friends you know you know take a deep dive anywhere you want to dive i'm going off with vronsky you know he's my true love and love justifies itself every rationalization in the world and old count vronsky who she treated like god just dumps her mm-hmm. and when that happens she has nothing left no god no family no friends She's literally all alone in the world, and of course, we know what happens at the end of the book. Mm-hmm. So, a terrible act of despair and suicide. But I mean, it's it's uh, you, you look at these things, and I think these great literary people, they have insights as to you know how does this work? And maybe they wouldn't say, "Well, I'm describing the devil," mm-hmm. but they are. Because those rationalizations, oh yes, part of them come from our own subconscious and our own ingenuity. But don't make no mistake about it. The, 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 the fire is fueled by the evil spirit himself. And we have to be so cognizant because God doesn't have to send anybody to hell. We choose it. We mm-hmm. let ourselves be seduced, go right into the darkness until it is almost impossible for us to turn around. But God keeps, as Ignatius says, keep 
biting us and, and, you know, trying to stop us and putting things into the back of our minds and trying to circle us off at each side. And I describe that in far more detail in my upcoming volume number two, which is coming out in uh, probably around late February or March, early spring, um, in volume two called Escape from Evil's Darkness. So anyway. um, (laughs) I love it. We'll return to Inside the Pages in just a moment. Did you know that Discerning Hearts has a free app in which you can find all your favorite Discerning Hearts programming? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more are found on the Discerning Hearts free app. Did you also know that you can stream Discerning Hearts programming on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. And did you know that Discerning Hearts also has the YouTube page? Be sure to check out all these different places where you can find Discerning Hearts. A Prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all that I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen. Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, What you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. We now return to Inside the Pages. Father Spitzer, it's such a beautiful way in which you help us to see. Because in a very real way, the reason we, generation upon generation, has looked to literature, and in our generation, of course, to movies and to different depictions of Mm -hmm. art, is to help us to be able to recognize it in case in our lives we end up seeing an element of it. We may not see the same type of experience as Anna Karenina in our life, Mm -hmm. but when we see a friend starting to do something, or we're being called Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. act out in a way that is counter what is normal for our existence, we recognize it then. And you you see the vice, and okay, this is what it is. And then usually there's a character in there who is going to show us what the virtue looks like, or the virtue Mm -hmm. that's being put aside. And in today's world, even in modern literature, they've taken classics. And I'm thinking of the, the tale of the Little Mermaid. When yeah. it was originally put out, the girl sees this unrequited love, is going to give up everything, including the one gift she has is her voice. She goes, yeah. and he turns out to be a dunderhead and just totally dismisses her. She ends up dying. Her father dies. Everything is bad. The, the message is... Don't give up the one thing you have. Don't give up yeah. that gift. And yeah. yet Disney took it and they flip it and make it a happy ending. So we have generations of kids who, and, and particularly girls who will see, well, if I give this one gift I have, ultimately everything will end up happy. And that's yeah. a lie, isn't it? Well, it is. And I, I think, you know, the one gift we have is God's love for us and translates, of course, into our love for others 
right? Because when mm-hmm. we uh, when we know His love, we we're free to love others with greater and greater, um, you know, sacrifice and and greater and greater compassion, and and it's just a very freeing experience. But as we separate ourselves from God, which of course is the first tactic of the devil, is to uh, to separate you from God, and then to separate you from God's teaching. Now, sometimes if he can't, you know, do that, what he likes to do is uh, is basically start off with uh, saying, oh, well, God loves you and is real. But, you know, this one commandment here, uh, I pick a sin, any sin, uh, the commandment against uh, greed, that's really unreasonable in this culture. This commandment against lust, I- I'm telling you, you know, you know, everybody's doing it just Mm -hmm. cohabitate you know have 10 premarital partners you know what the heck you know everybody's doing it it's okay you know and so there's the rationalization is always you know coming around the corner and when it comes around the corner um, you know, it's, there's always a rationalization. There's always a way in which this is put with a nice little bow on top, as you put it, you know, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, flipped into a kind of a, a nice ending. But there's never a nice ending. Mm-hmm. Or, I mean, you then look at the statistics and you go, oh, well, the number of premarital partners is inversely related to the longevity and the satisfaction in the marriage. Mm-hmm. So if you have one, zero premarital partners, you have a 5% chance of getting a divorce. You have one premarital partner, it jumps to 22%. If you have, you know, from uh, two to seven premarital partners or something of that nature, you have an average of a 30% chance of divorce. And then if you have more than seven or whatever it is, uh, you've got a chance of divorce that uh, is well above 40%. Now, you look at that and you go, well, wait a minute, what does that tell us? It tells you there may be some consequences uh, for doing this if it happens again and again and again. And, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and over again, expecting mm-hmm. a different result, as Einstein said. So the, the, the point I'm trying to get to is, you know, there's always the deceit. There's always the, you know, uh, well, if I can't get you to deny God, I'll get you first to sort of deny God's morality. It's too prudish. Oh, this is just the church trying to get control of what you're doing in your bedroom. Oh, this, you know, this is the uncompassionate church in a society that's trying to be more and more accepting. You you always get a, a, it's a beautifully gift-wrapped lie. And once you get the gift wrapped lie and you start following it, but you, whatever you do, don't look at the statistics, right? Because if you mm-hmm. start looking at the statistics on lifestyle, and that's why I wrote volume three, was mm-hmm. to expose all the lies. I just go what, one sociological study after the next sociological study. Every one of these uh, uh, the, in volume three, uh, you know, I take the 12 controversial teachings of the Catholic Church, and I just go right on through them and finally at the end of the book i just simply say all these teachings are right because if you violate them you can expect to have significantly higher rates of depression anxiety substance abuse suicides suicidal ideation impulsivity familial tensions aggressivity and at the end of the day of course you will lose your faith in god as well. And so all these things are going to happen. Just just here they are in the statistics. But by the way, not my statistics, statistics done by secular institutes and universities. And they basically tell you the whole story. The truth is, the Catholic Church not only leads to spiritual well-being, but emotional health, health for marriages and families, that is to say longevity and satisfaction that makes for a secure environment for children, and health for culture, that is to say that we have uh, you know, less social unrest, greater peace, greater cohesion and harmony within the culture instead of what we're experiencing today. For all intents and purposes, the devil's plan is very clear, but we've got enough evidence now to know Every single one of the churches teaching, I don't care if it's abortion, euthanasia, homosexual lifestyle, uh, pornography, uh, uh, gender change, um, uh, uh, premarital sex, extramarital sex, you name it. Uh, you know, the, the, all of these things, all these teachings, they're not only oriented towards spiritual well-being and heaven and salvation. They're oriented toward love, 
toward emotional health. I mean, by love, self-sacrificial, caring, compassionate love. You know, they're oriented toward that kind of love, and, and they're oriented uh, to toward societal and cultural health uh, as well. And, of course, to good marriages and families that are secure for those uh, nice children. So the point I'm trying to, to get to is um, listen hard to what the church says, because when you hear differently, it, it's the evil spirit. And the mm-hmm. first thing he, he's got in mind for you is to disobey that law, to follow your baser instincts and your ego. And once you follow your baser instincts and your ego, and you're in rebellion from God and you separate yourself from him, expect emptiness, alienation, loneliness, despair, uh, fear, and, and of course, guilt. And, and at the end of the day, a, a separation that is filled with a kind of darkness and isolation. Just expect it. And, and then when that happens, don't be surprised if you get what the American Psychiatric Association found. Um, you get an increase in depression, anxiety, uh, suicidal ideation, suicides themselves, impulsivity, familial tensions, uh, and um, substance abuse, etc., etc., etc. So don't be surprised. I mean, this is what the devil wants, and at the end of the day, he wants to bring us all down. He wants to bring the family down. He wants to bring marriage down. He wants to bring the culture down. He wants to bring it all down. And that is his plan. And all I can say is um, my, the, the whole reason for writing the trilogy is to prove it. And that's uh, what I, I think uh, my, my, my mission is to do. I'm not a perfect person. I, I don't know why God chose me to be a spokesman of this. But uh, at least uh, I've got enough of a rational mind to say, I think I can make a really good probative case that, uh, that um, yeah, uh, the devil should be exposed, and I'll expose him, even though I'm a very imperfect person myself. Well, praise God that you do. He's such a jerk, isn't he? I mean, he just... Yes. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's and, killing us. He's yeah. killing families. He's killing marriages. He's killing our individuals. He's killing our young people. He's killing us. I mean, yeah. we just got to stop believing the lies. Sorry. Yeah, and we have to we have to know what a lie is, and I think that's what you do. You do it so beautifully, Father Spitzer. I'm going to start calling it not the quartet and the trilogy. I'm just going to call it the Summa, because it's, it really <laughs> oh, don't is. Do that. uh, that's too elegant a company. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's your Summa, and I love it because it really oh, is. You. you again encourage people to get the quartet, the first a uh, four set of books uh, that are really, I mean, I think they're essential to understanding how we, we move and, and, and live our lives, especially in the spiritual lives, the things that come against us and what suffering is and the joy that we're seeking, the happiness that we're seeking. But this particular book, and I cannot wait for the second or the third, 2021 is going to be awesome because those books are coming. I mean, oh, thank you. I, yeah, and I think we need a relief from 2020 anyway. God will, I think, have mercy on us. Before you can help others, you really have to help yourself. It's the airplane rule. you got to put the mask yeah. on yourself before you can help anybody else. And that's what you are encouraging everyone to do. This is spiritual direction. This is one of the best books I've seen. It's not just, okay, spiritual warfare is over there. And your spiritual life is over here. No, there's an epic battle taking place here and now. And you help lead the way on all fronts, Father Spitzer. Well, I'm trying anyway. And God, I think, really gave me the inspiration to do this, even though, like I said, an unlikely person being very imperfect myself. But I think, you know, I just... You know, I, I just can't see us going into the darkness any further. Um, I, I think somebody, we, we all have to speak out. And so I'm hoping people will share some of these quotes with their friends and just uh, help them to see, you know, take the scales off the eyes, everybody. Uh, our culture is not safe. Our, our culture may feel good, but as uh, Solzhenitsyn said in his great uh, speech at Harvard University, what's all the smiling about? We're becoming decadent. We're becoming so decadent, we don't even know we're decadent. And, and he mm-hmm. says, you know, what's, what's all the smiling about? What's all the toasting about? What's all the joy for? Mm, beautiful. Right. We want to be, of course, joyful in God, but mm-hmm. not, not joyful in, uh, in our uh, attitude of ego comparative. And that's the thing. I mean, if we live in darkness all of our life, when somebody flips the switch on and there's yeah. light, how are mm-hmm. we going to recognize, how are we going to know what we're seeing? Because we've become so accustomed to living in that dark room. 
Oh, yeah. And, I mean, believe me, the devil always pulls the carpet out before Christ turns on the light. He's mm-hmm. going to claim his prey. And believe me, when he claims it, you will know. I mean, it, mm-hmm. and it comes out in despair and anxiety and depression and the, all the various symptoms I talked about, substance abuse, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Father Spitzer, I hope you're going to be doing a series on this trilogy. I hope you're going to be doing even more to break it open, but they have to start first with the text. You've got to get the books. Thank and, you, and I'm, I am going to actually, I'm putting together modules for high school and, and, uh, and um, trying to put together modules, too, for uh, uh, you know, the uh, senior capstone courses. And, uh, um, and so that's, our, that's my next project, because the trilogy is written. Uh, basically, it's now just going to be published you know, with about a four-month space in between the books. Uh, and so uh, Ignatius is publishing all of them. And, and uh, so Volume 2, as I said, probably come out in March. And how are things at the Magis Center? Oh, M- Magis is doing very, very well. And uh, we're in uh, 92 dioceses now uh, with our uh, um, curriculum on, uh, uh, you know, contemporary apologetics, faith mm-hmm. and science, and, you know, evidence for God, the soul, and Jesus. And uh, it's working very, very well, the kids who take it. Uh, um, and actually, if you just go to CredibleCatholic.com, uh, CredibleCatholic.com, just click on the seven essential modules. Everything is free there. It's uh, free of charge. Just take your kids through the seven essential modules. Give them the evidence uh, for God from uh, science and contemporary cosmology, the evidence for Jesus. The Shroud of Turin is utterly fascinating. The evidence mm-hmm. for a transphysical soul that will survive bodily death from near-death experiences. Very, very convincing to these kids. Ninety-seven percent of them say that um, these modules are very positive for maintaining and defending their faith. And that, you know, before you can, uh, you, know, you know, battle evil, you not only have to believe in God, but trust in him and his presence and know how to identify that presence in your life. And so we're trying to get it in a one-two punch here. Uh, so that's, that's uh, but Maj is doing well. And uh, just go, tell people to go to CredibleCatholic.com. I think they'll get a, a real good sense of what's available for the kids, seventh and eighth graders, um, uh, younger high school, older high school, and uh, college. Oh, the work is awesome. You're such a gift to us. If, you're, if you feel you're a, a lowly, not worthy vessel, then that just sounds like God's mode of operation, Father Spitzer. Oh. So we're very blessed to have you well, just reaching you out to much, us. Well, thank you very much, Chris, and we're blessed to have you. I mean, you constantly are helping us uh, to see, of course, God's presence and his love, and more importantly, uh, to see also you know, what's going awry in our culture and to bring so many different uh, perspectives to bear in this uh, good media apostolate in which you work. Well, I'm looking forward to March 2021. So, <laughs> Father <too>. Spitzer, <laughs> keep working on those, the SUMA. The SUMA's getting bigger. It's getting bigger. Oh, so. yeah. <laughs> Truly. Well, God bless you, Chris, and thanks for having me. With Father Robert Spitzer, we've gone inside the pages of Christ versus Satan in our daily lives, the cosmic struggle between good and evil. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to Ignatius.com, the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this particular conversation, visit DiscerningHearts.com, or you can find it inside the Discerning Hearts free app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors.